I think I've been involved in uh, what has been called the Global Integration Bootcamp now for oh, probably seven years or so uh, in it. So um, it's great that this is continuing every year, and I'm certainly very, uh, very proud and privileged to be part of this event. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about building event-driven integration architectures, uh, specifically with using Azure Event Grid. I'm going to mention um, a number of a, a few different platforms for for event handling, but I'm going to concentrate on Event Grid. Um, I'm going to the first part of my presentation is going to be a bit theoretical, and where I'm not talking about any specific product, we're talking about the concepts of integration and events. Uh, but bear with me if you can through that, because uh, there are some demos that I have planned, so you will see some live action um, in, in this presentation. Uh, let me just get that working. Uh, so a little bit about me. I work for Deloitte and I would call myself a, a senior integration architect at Deloitte. I'm also a Microsoft MVP and there's lots of other boring stuff on this slide uh, about me. So I'll tell you something maybe more interesting. Um, in a previous life, I was a professional musician. Uh, not a pianist, as this slide would uh, suggest. I was actually a classical trombone player and uh, played in various orchestras and stuff. Uh, but I cross trained into IT because I was tired of being poor. And uh, these days, uh, being busy with all that, all I really do in music is I play piano at my church. And the reason I play at my church is because uh, mo like most uh, Christian congregations, they're usually very patient uh, with putting up with my amateur capability and nobody would ever pay money to hear me play. So that's my, uh, that's my musical outlet these days. So this talk uh, being about events, I thought it would be a good idea to kind of introduce the concept and make sure we understand what we mean when we say an event. Uh, so this is one kind of event and uh, that's a spectacular photograph. And I wonder if, you, uh, if, you, if you've ever seen this before. I, I learned about it myself when I came across this, uh, but apparently uh, in a pyroclastic cloud when the particles were coming out of a volcano and rub against each other, they create such a massive amount of static electricity that you actually get lightning uh, in it sometimes. So that's a uh, uh, kudos to Sergio Tapiro who took that amazing photo. In the digital world, uh, most of our events aren't quite as dramatic as this one. Although I guess when somebody drops your production database, it might seem that way. But essentially, uh, an event means that something happened, uh, whatever that is, a file was created, um, you know, a record was updated in a database, or, you know, if you're living in the graphical world, maybe somebody uh, clicks something with a mouse. And more to the point, uh, somebody's interested in the fact that that event happened or some system or something needs to happen. Uh, if it, Otherwise, it's not really much of an event, I guess. And what that event should do is generate a notification so that it can trigger some sort of an action that follows on from that. Now, the event itself is really based on mere facts. Uh, this is not meant to transfer data, okay? And that's a distinction I'm gonna talk about a little bit later in the presentation when I, when I describe the difference between events and messages or eventing and messaging. Uh, but it is basically, they're usually pretty lightweight notifications. For example, if a file is created um, then you might get the event might consist of information like uh, what is the file type? What is the URL where the file is located? What time was it created? Um, maybe one or two things like that. What it, what it would not typically send is the contents of that file. Um, and there are two kinds of, uh, we can divide events into two kinds, which would be either discrete or series based. So I'll describe the difference between those uh, right now. I think the best example of a discrete event is uh, the one I just mentioned, which is that a file was created. That's discrete because that one event is actionable in itself. Uh, it is independent in that, in that regard. It, the significance of that event doesn't depend on other events happening around it. Now that isn't to say that the consumer of that event might not know, want to know about other files being created, but the point is that one file creation is, is significant enough itself that you can, you can generate a reaction from it. And it generally re reports uh, some kind of a state change. Uh, a record being updated in a database would be another example of that. Uh, by comparison, 
the series events are different in that the individual event usually doesn't have that much significance in isolation, but it becomes significant when you look at it in the context of the events that are around it. And I think a good example of this would be if you have a, an IoT monitor monitoring the temperature in this room and it registers an event that the temperature right now is 25 degrees Celsius. That in itself is not terribly significant, but if in two minutes time the temperature says it's 28 degrees and in three minutes time it says the temperature is 35 degrees, that starts to become significant because as you look at that series of events, you're going to see that those those state changes, those conditions that are being reported uh, are following a trend and uh, and it becomes important because you probably want to call the fire department in that case. So um, generally these type of events, series events um, are usually uh, on a timeline. Uh, not always, but that is uh, that is typical one way where you look at it. And I mentioned the difference between these two type of events because the platform that you would use to ingest and process these events, especially in an integration solution, are different because you need different features. Um, so you need something that can, for example, monitor this, the, uh, this stream of events that's happening and be able to derive the significance or the meaning of, of, um, of the context. Uh, another thing comparison I want to make before we jump into further is to talk about the difference between uh, event driven or event notification and uh, event sourcing. So with event notifications, and that is going to be the primary topic of this, this presentation, is essentially uh, just pushing out um, notifications about state changes, about things that happen, file is created, or, you know, or even maybe a temperature changes or something like that. Um, they are complete, completely disconnected from the, from the consumer of those events. So there's no expectation, there's no, there's no coupling at all in logic between the, the uh, system that generates the event and whoever consumes those. Uh, it's just pushing information out there. And typically, uh, there's no need for persistence of those events. As they happen, they're broadcast out. And then as far as the event producer goes, it's, it's forgotten. It may be that a consumer decides to persist those events, but it's not, um, it's not in itself uh, an expectation. Event sourcing is very different, and event sourcing means that you actually do need to persist those events and you need to persist them in the order that they happen, because the whole idea of event sourcing is that you can derive the current status of a resource from its event history, which is essentially an ordered sequence of events, and you can recover the state uh, of something because events themselves are immutable. Uh, so in this case, it's, it's very important to, to persist them, and it's also important that you have the ability to replay those events in the order that they happen. And that is, again, uh, that is a feature or a capability uh, that needs to be built into the platform. So that's why I wanted to distinguish between those two things. What I'm primarily going to talk about today is the event notification, the, the former of those two. So why do we want event-driven integration? Um, so uh, there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, we live in a world of APIs. You could say APIs make the digital world go around. And those APIs uh, generally, in, in these days, they rely on what we would call situational data, which is data that happens, occurs at periods, periods and times. Um, for example, you know, broadcasting state changes using IT devices, or maybe uh, capturing social media events or posts and things like that. Um, so uh, if you think about it, there's a lot of notifications that need to be handled. So it's very important to uh, figure out how you're going to maintain data consistency, how you're going to get the uh, events that are generated from those event producers uh, piped into whatever systems or processes that need to, to trigger and respond to those events. So it is very much uh, an integration type of problem. Now, about five or six years ago, um, Gartner's talked about this Copernican shift that happened where um, traditionally applications were built around the data. The data was the was the most important thing and everything everything was around that. So getting the data right was was essential. 
Um, nowadays, we're seeing that a lot of applications are being built around the events themselves, that it's all about capturing those events and responding to them. And that kind of ties into the next uh, aspect, which is the fact that we tend to live in a society now where we want everything in real time. We want to know about things as they happen. Um, so, for example, um, most of you would probably have an online bank account and you might have experienced a time when you made a, a fairly large charge on your debit card or your credit card or, or maybe in an unusual place like maybe overseas or something. And uh, almost immediately you would get a text message on your phone uh, alerting you to the fact that some charge was made, uh, made at that point uh, with the amount or with the location. Now that is obviously a, a security mechanism to make their, the bank is trying to verify that it's really you and that's triggered by the fact that it's unusual behavior. Um, you can imagine that if that notification came in the next day because it was processed as part of an overnight batch job, that probably wouldn't be terribly useful to you because if somebody was uh, had skimmed your card and was making fraudulent charges, they would have a whole day in which to do that before you were even aware of it. So that's just one example of how, why we want things to happen in real time. And event-based notification uh, allows you to do that. So when you're not relying on some sort of a batch process, that as the event happens, if a notification can be pushed out, it means that the systems that consume that event can react in real time. Uh, now, one way to react to those things in real time is that you have a system uh, that, that polls or looks for those events to occur. For example, something that polls a database to see if there's any, been, been any changes in it. Um, that is one way to do it, but the problem with that is that it's not really very real time, usually. The, the, the currency of those events is dependent entirely on your polling interval. So if you're polling only once an hour, well, then some of the events that you receive might be an hour old by the time that you get them. Uh, if you're polling every minute, then obviously they're a lot more current. But the thing is, with most polling structures, especially in the cloud where we have um, where we have pay if you pay as you go type of services, uh, those polling operations actually cost money and they cost effort. And the fact is, is that depending on how frequent uh, transactions happen, most of those polling uh, operations may actually yield no data, so there's really not uh, delivering you any value. If you have event-based notifications and, and you're actually triggering things to happen when the event occurs, then it's not only more timely, but it's also more efficient and potentially cheaper. So one thing about event notification structure is that it's based on a publish subscribe uh, sort of messaging scenario. Uh, now, event, event notifications are not the only things that are published and subscribed, but they are necessarily that way. Uh, so what you have in the case is that you have a publisher that could have multiple subscribers of which, um, you know, it doesn't, uh, the, the publisher is usually not tightly connected to those. And it's very, very easy as you build your application out that you can add more subscribers to expand the capability um, or the scalability of your application with no extra impact or effort on the account of the publisher. So it's a very good model for that. Well, I'm going to uh, use that as an opportunity to talk in, talk about a little bit about the difference between messaging and eventing. And to start that conversation, I'm going to talk a little bit of, just going to introduce some basic messaging patterns. Now, I don't know about you, but it's um, where I am right now. It's about a quarter past six in the evening uh, on Saturday. I haven't had dinner yet, and looking at that pizza is already starting to make my stomach grumble. That's uh, it's just amazing. <laughs> so I'll try not to salivate too much while I'm talking about this. But I do think that the pizza analogy here makes a very, very good example uh, for messaging. And and that link there is to a blog post I wrote a while ago to uh, where I where I actually detail this in in writing. If you um, if you're interested in following it, and I hope I haven't offended anybody's grandmother. Uh, so let's say that you want to order a pizza. Well, before you can order that pizza, you need to know some information. Uh, you need to know one, that the pizza shop is open, uh, and two, you probably need to know what's on the menu uh, to make sure that the kind of pizza you want to order is available. Now, that kind of information is readily available, and you can either phone up 
a pizza shop and if they answer, well, that answers your first question straight away. Um, or you can even go to their website and just look and see what's on their menu. So this is an example of what we call synchronous request response, where you make a request and you need that response right away. And that response should come back right away because it doesn't take any significant amount of time or effort to process that request. Um, so that's a perfect example of synchronous request response. A uh, very efficient kind of mechanism, but uh, if that information uh, takes a little bit of time to get to, uh, then that's not always a good operation for it because there's a, there's a possibility that you could time out, right? Um, that your, 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 your channel, the open channel that you start with that request might drop before you get the response back. Um, so the next step is, is once you've figured out the shop is open and you know what pizza you want, is you place an order. Now, usually you don't typically expect to order a pizza and get it handed to you straight away. If you did, it's probably not going to be a very good pizza because it's been sitting under a heat lamp somewhere. Uh, typically what happens is that you place your order and they, and they say, okay, your order's placed, here's your ticket number or your, or your name or whatever it is that they reference uh, for that particular order. And they say the pizza will be ready in 20 minutes. Uh, that's all well and good. And that's what you would expect. So that ticket that you get or that reference uh, to your order is, uh, is comes back straight away to you. So that's part is synchronous request response. But the actual thing you're after, which is your pizza, doesn't come straight away. You have to wait for that. Now, here's where it gets interesting. There's two different ways that you can retrieve that pizza. One is that, and probably preferable for many of us, is that you can ask it to be delivered for you. Uh, so to do that, you have to give the pizza shop your address. Uh, so that's one thing that they require, right? And they have to have the ability to deliver the pizza to you. Um, the, um, the good thing about that is that while you're waiting for that pizza to deliver, you're not blocked. You can do other things. You can go watch TV, phone a friend, have a beer, whatever, you know, whatever you want to do. And when the pizza is ready, it will just come to you. Uh, and that is that's a great situation, but it does require that you give them your address. In the digital world, uh, that can be uh, tricky if, for example, you're making a request out to an external um, service somewhere and you expect them to call you back, you have to make sure that you have a path through your firewall the corporate firewall for them to reach you because they literally have to initiate a new connection to give you that information. Sometimes that's difficult. So there is an alternative method. Let's say, for example, that you don't want to, um, uh, you don't want them, the, the pizza place to know your address and you say, I'll come and pick it up. Okay, so what will happen is they'll tell you the pizza is ready in 20 minutes, but you'll get there in 10 minutes time and you'll ask them, is my pizza ready? And they'll say, no, no, it's still in the oven. So you sit down and you start sniffing the uh, the aromas of the pizza's cooking and your, your stomach starts rumbling and you get up a couple of minutes later and you say, is it ready yet? And they'll tell you, no, no, we're still cooking it, mate. Um, great, you gotta sit down. Uh, eventually you get up again and ask them if it's ready and they say, it's coming out of the oven now and we're boxing it up for you. So that's an example of what we would call a polling operation where you, as the requester, uh, keep asking whether your service request has been filled, right? And eventually, hopefully, uh, one of the times that you ask, it will be fulfilled and they'll be able to give it back to you. So that requires extra effort on your side, but it does get around the situation where you have to open an inbound port in your firewall. So there's two ways to, uh, to describe that. The third uh, scenario I'm going to talk about is, is publish subscribe. Now let's say you got that pizza and boy, it was yummy. It was really, really good. Um, and you want to be notified, uh, but but it was kind of on the expensive side. So you want to be notified when they're having specials and you tell the owner of the restaurant and says, yeah, can you tell me when you got sales on? He said, sure, I'll put you on the mailing list and I'll send you out and you'll be notified uh, whenever we have uh, specials on or maybe if we add new pizzas to the menu. Now, the thing about this, is that the owner needs your email address. He needs some place to send it. But once uh, he has that, he doesn't really care um, how many people are on that list because he only publishes his newsletter newsletter once. 
but whatever he's using to send out his notifications will do that automatically for him to as many participants as there are. So you might say that's kind of he's loosely connected to the people who are receiving it. We like this pattern very much in integration because a publish subscribe model is very, very decoupled. Uh, it means that it's easy to add multiple subscriber or multiple integrations uh, and expand the capability like I pointed out in uh, a few slides ago. So it's very extensible. It's very, very scalable. Um, that is uh, that is our favorite kind of messaging pattern in the integration world. Uh, it's very powerful, but it does require uh, that you have some way to track all of those subscribers if you want to see what's actually happening in your enterprise. That model, of course, is what we based event uh, based notifications on, and you'll see that these three messaging patterns correspond to your command query and event, which uh, which is something that you would have heard of before, no doubt. OK, so messaging versus eventing. So with messaging, uh, and this is a uh, this is really, really an excellent description that I've kind of stolen from Clemens Vaster. So Clemens uh, is the uh, head of the service bus, Azure service bus team, uh, and he's uh, an incredibly intelligent guy. And if you ever have a chance to see any of his presentations, they're, they're just amazing. Uh, usually about uh, two thirds, uh, halfway through or two thirds of the way through, it starts going over your head a little bit. But uh, but he's a brilliant man, and I thought he did an, an exceptional job of, of representing this. Clemens basically says that messaging is about intents. The publisher of that message usually has an expectation that something is going to be done, and that would be issuing, say, a command, for example, or maybe uh, transferring a value or something like that. And because of that, messaging is usually conversational. So it's not just the simple fire and forget. It's usually you send something and you expect something back. Uh, from that, or you uh, at least very much want an acknowledgement that your command has been received. And it's usually heavily governed by contracts where both sides uh, understand um, what they're receiving and how they're receiving it. Contrast, as I, as I mentioned before, events are really based on facts. Uh, they're quite lightweight, and typically the publisher of the event doesn't know or care who's actually receiving uh, that information. Uh, when you're talking especially about series based events, then the contents thing and the ordering is very, very important uh, in all of that. And it's very, very extensible uh, because you can build extra subscribers to those events without any impact on the publisher or even knowledge of the publisher. So this just shows a little bit about the communication patterns. As I said, that messaging tends to be a bit conversational where the participants usually know who they are. Uh, they know who they are, uh, who, you know, who the, who the sender probably knows who the receiver is, and you get a lot of two-way uh, conversations. Some may be one way, but it mostly two-way. With eventing, uh, the event publisher doesn't typically know who the events are going out. It's it's literally fire and forget, um, and um, and whoever's interested in those events will have subscribed to them. Now, that said, even though messaging is governed by contracts, um, it helps if the subscribers at the events knows what information that they're getting and knows how to uh, absorb it. Uh, so that requires a schema. Now, the computer Cloud Native Computing Foundation has worked for a number of years on creating a, an industry-wide specification uh, for describing cloud events. Uh, and this is a non-proprietary format that's picked up by a number of different proprietary formats, and you can guess that Microsoft will be one of them. Um, so uh, following this, I think we're, we are at uh, an approved uh, schema level, and that, and that version is 1.0. And this is an example of what a cloud event uh, schema looks like, or a cloud event message would look like. Uh, so you can see a few things uh, straight away. First, you have the schema version. Um, which is uh, which is specified, but you've got uh, they all have this these three main metadata properties. So the first is a type, which tells you what type of event this is. In this case, this is a pull request, a creation of a pull request. The source is where that um, where that event comes from, which is typically you might think of it as the topic or the queue that 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 the event gets published to. 
Um, the subject then is something more particular to describe that specific event and distinguish it from others. So in this case, this would be an identifier for that pull request, which they just put one, two, three as an example here. Um, each uh, event also, event message also has its own unique identifiers, and this is apart from any uh, any context of the of the system that generates it. It's just for that for that event. It's typically like a GUID type of thing, uh, and a timestamp of when it was created. And then you get into the actual payload of that event, which is the data. And as I mentioned before, events typically are are lightweight. Uh, they're not meant to carry heaps of data, it's like, like you wouldn't uh, be sending the contents of a file or the whole contents of a database uh, on an event, but you just enough information to be able to tell the subscriber, okay, uh, this is to identify that, yes, I'm interested in this, and this is, um, and if I need to get more information, I know where to go and get it from. Uh, so in this case, uh, the data content type tells you how to read what's in the data field, and then you have the data itself. Now they did build in some ability to extend that, so you can add additional uh, properties uh, to this event if that will help your, your application. But now let's look at an example of, uh, of an eventing in, in, in a sample application and how the pat pattern might work. So let's say that you have an application that's putting out log data, okay? So you would publish that log data to, uh, to a topic Topics can have multiple subscribers. One of those subscribers might be uh, a handler that basically stores every every one of those log events and persists them in a data store. Fair enough. Uh, you might have another handler that only subscribes to error events. So you see that the subscribers to the to these topics have the ability to put filters on it, so they can only receive the events that they're interested in. And that handler might say, oh, we got an error for this application. Let's send out an SMS to whoever the unlucky person is that's on duty that night to, to handle it. Uh, and there might be a, a further subscriber to warning events that pushes out uh, notifications, but in a, slight, a less obtrusive way, let's say by email, for example. So there's a perfectly good example of using event notifications. Now, um, there is a problem with this in the sense that um, suppose your application is calling out to a service and that service goes offline for a while. Uh, depending on how much traffic is going through this application, you could be pumping out a whole lot of error notifications uh, all at once, and the poor guy on the mobile phone is getting spammed, right? Where he can't even use his phone because he's getting so many messages hit at the same time. So the way you might work around that is that you introduce uh, something that looks at these events rather as in, rather than individual discrete events, but looks at them as series-based events. And uh, and this icon here is for um, Stream Analytics, uh, which is a service in Microsoft. That's just an example. Uh, and Stream Analytics has the capability to look at a, a series of events and then draw uh, some kind of analysis from it. So you might have a rule that uh, if I've sent that event notification out, um, once, I'm not going to send it again uh, if it's the same event type uh, for five minutes, right? Just to give a little bit of a breather. Um, you can also change your topic to be something more like what we call an event ingester, and that would be necessary if you needed the ability to replay those events. Uh, so that's when you start to turn this into more of an event sourcing solution. Okay, so moving on to platforms, there are a number of different eventing platforms out there. I'm sure you would have heard of many of these. Uh, probably Kafka, of course, is a very popular one. Um, Kafka is a distributed streaming platform that combines messaging, storage, and stream processing, and you can in, uh, run that online, uh, sorry, on-prem or in the cloud. And there's also a managed cloud offering on that uh, that's uh, provided by Confluent. Uh, Kinesis is uh, is if you're working in the Amazon space. So Amazon Kinesis Data Streams is integrated with a number of AWS services, and that is cloud only. That offering. Solace is an event distribution and messaging middleware. Uh, it's it supports a, a, an event mesh that supports streaming, pub sub, queuing, request response, 
And it is also available in cloud as a managed services, as well as uh, at an appliance. Uh, and I think you might be able to run it on prem. So I'm going to concentrate in this um, presentation more on Microsoft's offering, which is the event hubs and the event grid. So I'll explain the difference between those two products. Event hubs is really, it's high scale, high availability, multi-protocol multi event streaming engine. It is an event ingester. Um, and basically it has a partition model so that it can separate those events and have, uh, have, have consumers. So this would be for like really, really high traffic, for example. Um, it has most importantly, the ability to replay events. You can think of event hubs as being um, like a tape recorder uh, for event where you can go back and, and replay things. And that should tweak for you based on what we've talked about, uh, that that makes it a very, very good solution for event sourcing. Uh, it's also very, very good for, for series-based events if you want, because you can pipe it to things like stream analytics and then, and then do analysis and then replay those analysis and have multiple uh, streams uh, coming out of it. So that um, that is uh, what Event Hubs is. It does have the ability to integrate with Kafka, which is nice. Uh, some features about it, there there is, depending on the tier level that you have, there's a certain level of persistence that it has by default. Uh, but if you need it longer than that, you can, um, uh, there is an archive capability with these events so that you can persist them uh, indefinitely. So that uh, that's an example of event hubs. Um, the other product, which is the one I'm going to concentrate on for the rest of the presentation, is Azure Event Grid. And this is more, um, this is more about reactive uh, events, about no event notifications. It's an Azure-wide eventing uh, backplane for distributing and handling discrete events raised at the platform level, either or by custom applications and partner platforms as well. So you can see, for example, aside from integrating with a whole bunch of uh, Azure services, and there are many, many more, by the way, than what are shown on this slide, uh, it also can integrate and work with other vendor products, including Google Cloud, SAP, and Oracle, and IBM. Uh, it then has the ability to publish to just about any kind of Azure service that, that is capable of consuming events, as well, again, as uh, some of these other things. And it, and it also includes, if you can see here, uh, webhooks, which means that anything, any custom application you have that can expose a webhook uh, can consume events from event grids. It is uh, it is highly scalable. I'll talk about that in a moment and very, very resilient in how it handles those events. Uh, but another really key factor about event grid is that it's a push push model. What that means is that when an event is published, Azure Event Grid takes care of pushing that event out to the subscribers. It doesn't rely on the subscribers polling for those events. So you really get real time or very close to real time uh, performance with Azure Event Grid, and it's a very efficient model. So the architectural pattern, um, as I said, it's uh, it's a push style distribution of discrete events. Uh, there's no relation to those events. Uh, there is no persistence of those events once it's, it goes out and it actually gets delivered to the subscriber. Uh, it's gone. Uh, event Grid doesn't care anymore about it. Um, it does support uh, schemas, including Cloud Event Schema, as well as Microsoft's own uh, proprietary schema, and it actually even allows you to, to specify your own custom schema if you want to. Uh, so it's very, very simple integration with, uh, with a, as I said, a whole host of, of Azure services. In fact, most of them uh, are available in that, that, are, that are, are capable of, of cluing in events. I will show you an example of a couple of them in my demos. Uh, as far as uh, being reliable and performance, so um, as I said, it is very near real time. Uh, they're aimed in 99% to be sub second in terms of the latency in that. Um, it is designed uh, to handle 10 million events per second per region. So to explain this, uh, if you're familiar with Azure and how it works, there are there are regions in Azure, there are geographical regions all over the world. 
Um, event Grid is a, a ring zero service, which means that it's, dis it's deployed to all Azure regions around the globe, uh, and it works as a service within that region. You don't actually provision an event grid. Um, the event grid is just there. What you do provision is a topic uh, that you want to capture events into. Uh, and 10 million events per second, that's pretty, that's pretty, really big. Um, it's also very uh, resilient in terms of how it will publish those events. So as I mentioned, this is a push-push service. It doesn't rely on um, polling from the subscribers. So what event grid will do is if it can't get that event delivered to that subscriber, it will keep retrying it uh, by default for up to 24 hours. And it will do that in an exponential backoff uh, mechanism. So for example, it might retry in 10 seconds and then it will retry the next time in 30 seconds and then it will wait one minute and then five minutes and, and, and so and so. Um, and each one of those retries, it adds a little bit of randomization to the retry interval which is very clever because uh, let's say that you have a whole bunch of events that are pushed at once, but your subscribing service is offline. Uh, what's going to happen, or temporarily offline, what's going to happen is that if it, if it retried every all of those events at the same time, then you're just basically saturating you know, the endpoint of, of that service again, and you keep moving the problem further down the road. By just introducing a little bit of randomization, you can start to fan out those events, so it can give you a your subscribing service uh, an opportunity to handle that that huge load. Um, so a few little further statistics. Um, this figure came from Microsoft um, uh, about a year and a half ago. I, I've lost my contact, so I don't have an updated figure. But at that time, uh, their uh, event grid platform, uh, and actually all the entire uh, service bus and, and, and messaging platform on uh, Microsoft, was capable of handling two and a half trillion requests per day. Uh, that's what they were getting. Uh, that's that's what that big number is. And their success rate is almost six nines. Now that um, that's, looks pretty impressive until you start to realize that, well, what the six nines look like when you have such a big number of requests. So it actually uh, looks like this. That's five million failures a day. That doesn't look really impressive. It actually is very impressive. But um, but the point I'm trying to make here is not to embarrass Microsoft. What I'm trying to make, make is that when you build your applications on eventing, you are going to have to cater for potential failures. So that's just something to be aware of. And if you're building, uh, uh, say, for a, a, an, an application that those events are critical, uh, for example, if you're doing financial transactions, probably not the best platform to do it in an eventing model. That probably should be more of a, a an enterprise messaging uh, solution that you use instead. Right, uh, that said, uh, if Event Grid fails to deliver the message, um, you, it doesn't necessarily have to just drop it completely. You can configure optionally uh, a dead letter handling. Now for that, you just need to give it a storage account where you want it to send all the events that it couldn't send out. So you can recover them later. And you can configure that by the portal, the PowerShell, or for the command line interface for Azure. And uh, that QR code will take you to an article that talks about how to manage that. Um, some limitations. Uh, remember that I said events tend to be, should be lightweight, that you're not supposed to send a, a lot of data through with them. So there is a 64 kilobyte message size limit. That's also obviously how event grid can perform really, really well. It's because it's not handling large messages, and that's why it can be so fast. There is no ordering with events. Uh, the order that they receive is not always the order that they're delivered. Uh, so you can't base it on that. If you need ordering, uh, you probably want to use event hubs for that because that has that replay capability. Uh, event Grid does no replays. As soon as the event is successfully delivered to, the to all subscribers, uh, it's dropped. It doesn't exist anymore. Um, there's also, um, as I think I mentioned, a one day time to live. Uh, that's by default and exponential back off retries. I think I've gone through that and that is configurable, by the way. I'll show you that in my demo. You want to create uh, events in Azure. There's two ways to do it. You can start from the source itself. Any, Azure, any source 
in Azure that has the ability to publish events will have an events uh, tab in their um, in their configuration portal. And when you go to that, you have the ability to create an event subscription. And uh, there's also even quick links if you want to make that consumer to be a logic app or an Azure function. Uh, but there are many other options as well. The other way to do it is you can start from uh, the subscriber uh, the receiver. Let's say, for example, you want to design a logic app to receive events. Logic apps um, has a, an event trigger uh, that you can configure in there, an event grid trigger, I'm sorry, uh, which you then can configure that way. So there's two ways you can do it. Uh, keeping an eye on the time here. Um, so, as I mentioned, Azure has uh, has two different services for handling events, and they also have a service bus, which is about messaging. And I and I think it's just really uh, good to kind of lay this out on screen and be able to show the differences between these these different services so that you understand uh, what to use when. So, service bus is about messaging, and it's very high value enterprise messaging. So, it's basically made up of of topics and queues. Uh, but unlike Azure queues, which is a very simple queuing messages or Azure storage queues, uh, there's it come service bus comes with bundle with a, a lot of big features like it can do sessions, it can do transactions, it can do deduplication, uh, uh, message forwarding and all, all kinds of things. So uh, it is very, very resilient. And if you were doing an application, for example, that had financial transactions, I mean, this would be the kind of product that you would use for that. Important to understand, though, that when you publish messages to a service bus topic or a queue, the consumers of those topics and queues have to uh, pull. They have to pull the messages of their queue. It is not a push-push model. It's a push-pull model. Event Hubs, as I mentioned before, it, it works excellent as a big data pipeline because uh, it's it's you know hugely scalable for for handling event streams uh, and distributed data. And and this. Uh, product does have the replay capability, so it works really well uh, for event sourcing if you need to do that. Event Grid is uh, about event notifications, and it's really handy for reactive programming, where you, something needs to react to a status change. Uh, very, very efficient and and um, uh, uh, and resilient in how it does that, and it is a push push model uh, for events. And this is um, this is an excellent article. Uh, that Microsoft put out that talks about the differences between services and not just these three, but uh, a lot of other services as well, including Azure storage queues. I think it's about seven different things that they, they actually compare in that article. So definitely worth checking out. OK, I did promise you that we would have some live action. So I am going to uh, launch into the demo now, and the demo that I'm going to show you is I'm going to build this in front of you, but it shows how easy it is to to set up uh, an event subscription in Azure. What we're going to do is we have a, a monitor events on a storage blob, and every time uh, a file is created in that storage blob, it's going to publish an event. And I'm going to show that you can apply filters to those events so that um, so that uh, you can distinguish between JPEG images and PDF files uh, being published on that. OK. Now, uh, hopefully you'll all be able to see my Azure portal. And um, and in here, what we're looking at, uh, somebody come off mute and tell me if that's not the case, by the way, because I can't see my team screen uh, at the moment for the chat. Um, but what you should be looking at is a storage account uh, that I have configured in, in Azure. Um, and you'll see uh, that I have got, actually I'm gonna open that in a new tab because it just makes it easier to look, that there is a con single blob container in that. When it finishes refreshing, here we go, called test container. And right now there are no files, there's no content in that, in that container. Now I want to create uh, an event uh, subscription uh, or notification every time that uh, something happens. So in this storage account, I have my events tab. And when that loads, um, I have the ability to add an event subscription. Now, if I wanted to create a logic app, I can I can I can click that or an Azure function or Azure Data Explorer. But I'm just going to do this manually because what I'm actually going to do is create a, a web hook. So I need to give this uh, a name. I'll give it I'll call it EG Demo JPEG. 
The reason why I'll do that is because I'm only going to be interested in JPEG files. You'll see that for the event schema, I can choose between Microsoft's proprietary event grid schema or the standard uh, industry standard cloud event schema or a custom input schema if I want. And at some point I'll be asked to obviously to, uh, to get that schema if I wanted to use that. But for simplicity and for this demo, I'm just going to use the event grid schema. Um, I'm going to, that's my source. I've got to give it a topic name. So I will call this demo one, okay, as the topic name. Oops. Yeah, it does like that. Okay, good. Um, filter uh, event types. So you can see that I can, sorry, I can actually uh, subscribe to all different kinds of event types uh, with this. The ones by default are blob created and blob deleted. I'm really only interested in blob created, so I'm just going to leave it filtered to that. And then here I got to tell it where, where it's going to publish it to. And you can see I can choose an Azure function, storage queues, event hubs, hybrid connections. There's a lot of places that I can send uh, this information to. I'm going to choose webhook. And the reason is because I want you to be able to actually see the message uh, that comes out. So I need a subscriber endpoint to send that to. So what I'm going to do is go over to, I've got in, um, in PyDream, which used to be request BIM, uh, I've set up an endpoint in here called demo one. If I click into that workflow, I've got a URL here, which I'm going to copy and I go back and I'll paste that here. Okay, and I'll confirm the selection. Uh, now there is something that I have to do. I need to validate that endpoint before this will work properly. But before I do that and create it, I want to show you some of the other tabs. Uh, under filters, I can enable subject filtering. And you can see that I can have my subject begins with or ends with something, and I can make it case sensitive if I want. In this case, I'm only interested in JPEG files. Oops, type property. Okay, so I'm going to make that my filter. I also can do more complicated filters. I can actually filter on any one of these properties, which are going to always be part of that event grid schema. Or I can do custom properties that are inside the data payload and it tells you how you can reference those things. So I could do that as well. Uh, but I'm not going to, uh, to, to do that for this particular demo. Additional features, you can see that I can enable dead lettering if I want to handle events that can't be delivered. Uh, but for that, I have to select the blob container to send it to. You won't need to do that for this. I can also configure the retry uh, policy. Now, the reason I might want to do this is because maybe these events are going to expire after, like maybe if I, if I don't get the event, for example, within the first hour, um, then I don't want it at all because it's already out of date. So you can configure that here. Uh, you can minimize the number of delivery attempts, keeping in mind that the charging model for event grid is every delivery attempt does have a cost to it. It's tiny, but it does have a cost to it. I won't bother doing that here. I can also enable expiration time for this whole subscription itself to drop. So say I'm only interested in, in capturing events for one day and then I don't want to, I don't care anymore. And actually I'm going to leave that because by default it's chosen tomorrow. And I know that after this demo is over, I really won't need it anymore. So that's going to clean itself up for me. There's some stuff here to do also around batching, around, uh, around authentication using Active Directory uh, labels, delivery properties, um, these, this actually enables you to insert uh, headers into the message that's published. So for example, you might use this to uh, configure some authentication on your subscriber. And then after all of this, you can see the actual uh, ARM uh, template that's used to create this. And you can actually edit in here too, if you want to. So with all of that, uh, I've created a webhook. Now, one of the things I'm gonna have to do is to validate uh, that webhook when it happens. So if I go back to my demo, at the moment it's listening, it hasn't received any particular events, uh, but when I hit create, it's going to send the subscription validation event, which I need to reply to in order to make this deployment happen. So if I go back here and do a refresh on this particular workflow, what I should see is that I get load recent events. There we go. Uh, just now. So if I look in body raw, you'll see that I've got an event that's come in uh, from my um, from my event grid topic. And it the type of event is 
a subscription validation event. Now in this data payload, there's a validation URL, which I need to call uh, in order for event grid to finish creating that that subscription. And this is only just to to make sure um, to make sure that I actually own uh, that URL before it uh, creates it. So I'm going to go ahead and say and then you're going to say it says webhook successfully validated the subscription endpoint. So now if I go back here, you'll see that my deployment succeeded uh, for that. And I now have a working subscription. Uh, I will do this. Actually, I'm not going to do it. I, I was going to create another one for PDS, but I'm just looking at the time and I really do want to get to my second demo. So um, we only have one um, uh, one uh, filter event and it's and it's going and any time that I create a JPEG file, I should have an event published uh, that shows up in there. So I'm going to do an upload. I'm going to select the file and I'm going to choose my JPEG file here. OK, uh, so we'll choose that. Actually, tell you what, I'll choose both, but you'll see that an event is only generated for the JPEG. So we'll click that. We'll upload both of those files. Oops, let's click upload. That shouldn't take long at all. And there they are. So now if I go back into my um, my web uh, here and I refresh this. then what I should see is another event that has happened 15 seconds ago. And if I look in that body, now I'm going to copy this uh, copy value and put it in, in to uh, uh, get it to a, a code editor that I can nicely format it. Done. Format document. Yep. OK, and now we can see uh, what we have here is that the subject of this event is that image that I uploaded, which is dan.jpg. And it's a blob created event type. It has its own identifier, of course. Uh, and you'll see that the data payload has a bunch of metadata about that particular image file that was created. Um, so you can see, you know, it doesn't have the contents, but it tells you the type of file that it is, the URL to where it is, um, you know, a few other things. So again, this only took a couple of minutes for me to do that. It probably took longer because I had to talk about it. Um, I'm going to go on to my second demo because I know that I'm sort of running out of time. The second demo that I want to talk to you is a scenario that's a little bit more complicated and I've pre-built this one. So I'm working as a developer in, um, in a company and that company has provided me a virtual machine to do my development on, but uh, the machine is not really very highly spec, and I'm getting really tired of long compilation times. Um, so I want to go in there and upgrade the machine because I've been given admin, ac admin access to it. But uh, unbeknownst to me, the administrator has been very clever. And what he's done is he's created an application through EventGrid that monitors events in that resource group. And he's going to filter, use a logic app to filter, to capture that event and start a workflow. So that workflow is going to call out call out to the uh, virtual machine because the information that comes back from that from the, the event doesn't actually specifically give the machine size but it does tell me what the machine resource is so i use an azure function to call into that resource group and get the current size for the vm and then i use um, another um, uh, an azure function to go look up and see whether the size that that machine is, is actually uh, an allowed size or not. And if it's not, it's going to generate an email notification to the administrator and say, hey, your developer's done the wrong thing here. Uh, so that application uh, I'm going to show you now. OK, let's go back to our Azure service. And what I've created here is I've got a logic app um, that I've created. Cancel. Oh. Uh, yeah, no, no, no. Just say cancel. I don't know why that's saying I haven't done anything. Okay, let's go into the designer. Yeah, just say okay, that's fine. Uh, the designer on this it has a trigger, which is an event grid trigger. And that event grid trigger is monitoring the resource group where I have my virtual machine. So anytime a resource event occurs, uh, and it's a right success. You see there's all different kinds of actions, but I only really care about the actions that, that are actually successful. 
uh, it's going to trigger this logic app. And it's then going to look and see whether that resource contains the string virtual machine, because I only care about virtual machine changes. Uh, if it isn't, it just terminates there. But if it is, uh, it's going to go in the true um, uh, thing, and, and it's going to, which means that it's just going to keep going. Uh, then what I have to do is call out to that Azure function that's going to go and get the virtual machine size uh, for that. And it's the subject is the subject that comes back from the event grid event, which tells me with the, the URL to the virtual machine. And then it's going to take the output of that Azure function and ask whether it's an approved size. Now that, that function should return a Boolean, which is true or false. And, um, and then it's going to check if, if, that's, if that's true. Uh, sorry, the first function goes and gets the uh, the details of the virtual machine and the second call to it, a different Azure function then goes and queries whether the size is, um, is an allowed size. If it isn't, it's going to send a notification email uh, with high priority out to, to or uh, sorry, uh, if it isn't, that is, it's a high priority, uh, which says it's an unauthorized size change. If it is an allowed size, then it's just going to send an email notification at a lower priority. So let's uh, let's see if we can trigger this. Um, I uh, also going to show you my email box, which is currently empty. OK, and I'm going to go into the virtual machine and you'll see that it's a DS2 V2. I'm now going to change that size uh, to one that's double the, uh, the CPU and RAM. Uh, but it's not going to be an allowed size. And, it, and because this machine isn't running, that won't take very long to do that. We now go into our overview uh, for this, and we'll see that uh, we've had, uh, that we've just triggered. Uh, oh, sorry, hang on. Start later than pick a date today. Those are my tests from earlier. Okay, so let's refresh this. No runs, but um, it may take uh, a minute or so uh, for that to trigger, but what we're going to see is that an event is going to be triggered, and I'll see a message come into my um, to my logic to my email box as well. So there are obviously much more efficient ways we can build this, but this is uh, this is an example of building uh, an event-based integration uh, and actually trying to do something somewhat meaningful. In reality, you could use Azure Policy to control this, but uh, but this is just an example. Uh, uh, to work it out. So that is taking a little bit longer than it should. So I'm just going to go back and finish off my slide deck because I'm going uh, very close and then we'll come and take a peek at that again. So in summary, um, event-driven design allows for cost-effective, real-time, responsive applications uh, in a very, very efficient way. Um, and it doesn't require polling. Uh, I tried to explain that eventing is not the same as messaging. We're not talking about pushing data around or or having uh, tightly coupled uh, conversational type of things. We're talking about event notifications. And there are obviously different types of tools for, for different platforms or depending on what you need to do with your eventing. So you should um, consider what, what it is that you're trying to do before you choose the product. And if you want to connect with me, please use that QR code. I just ask that... Um, when you if you try if you submit a request in in linkedin to connect just tell me that you you've attended this presentation uh i get a lot of requests from people i don't know so this way i'll know what the connection is if you do that and let's just go back and look now and see if we got anything happening here ah so the logic app is running uh right now if we go into the designer we can actually okay okay that that's fine uh, we can actually go in and see what's happening in real time. Uh, actually, no, what I needed to do was the activity log. Uh, call back URL. Yep, two minutes ago. I actually really need that. Okay, so it happened. Uh, the logic app ran. We can see that it went through the path of sending an alert email, which means if I go into my email box, I should now have a message that says unauthorized VM. Uh, size change. OK. Um, that pretty much wraps up my presentation. I think right on time, maybe a minute over. <laughs>
Awesome. Right on time, as you said, Dan. So uh, once again, thank you for that uh, kickoff for the for the Azure Integration Bootcamp. Uh, it was a great pleasure for you to join us all the way from Australia. Um, so now we are on to our next session. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to invite Alpa. Hello there, Alpa. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, Alpa. Yes, we can. Yeah. Yes, we can hear, yeah. hear you very well. Thank you very much.